The anime starts with the command center telling the patrolmen to keep watching the area, but they didn't expect a kaiju to emerge from the city river it's Godzilla. This quickly activates the emergency alarm, making civilians follow evacuation procedures. The target is moving from Yatova to Yamashita, estimated to be 60 meters long with a strength of about 3.5. Helicopters head towards it, but there's no thermal response within a 3-kilometer range. So, they order all units to fire at the target, leading it to a meeting point. Some excited civilians wonder which division is coming. Someone mentions it's the third division. They arrive swiftly, distracting the monster. One of them fires a high-powered cannon, blowing a hole in its chest, causing a huge explosion, tearing it apart. Now we meet our true protagonist, Kafka Jivino. He works on the disaster cleanup team specialized in dealing with the aftermath of battles against kaijus. When the third division passes by, people gather to applaud them, happy to see them protecting peace and the future. Captain Mina Ashiro is with them. Kafka tries to catch a glimpse of her in the crowd before heading to his work area, where their battle begins after everything else ends. Though no one pays much attention or expresses gratitude, this is their secret battle against the kaijus. Someone approaches with a drone, saying the Isumo techs want a sample of the kaijus. Another worker says they can't cut the monster's body anymore due to its fat, so they need to bring a thermal chainsaw. There, Kafka warns one of them not to lift that unknown organ yet, but his warning comes too late as the organ breaks, causing some of its inner substance to burn one of the workers. So, this job isn't easy. Our protagonist approaches to calm him down, saying the damage is only skin deep. He administers proper treatment for the burn, also mentioning that this has happened many times and the only thing needed is to fill out the accident report. He complains that the third division always leaves the area a mess as it's difficult to identify the organs. Plus, they don't think they can finish everything in just one week. Then, a superior approaches, informing them that they'll change places since there's a shortage of personnel in the area, particularly dealing with intestines where there's poop. Kafka tries to escape the disgust, but ends up being dragged by the others. One rookie asks if working in the intestines is as heavy as they say, and a veteran explains that if you can imagine what a kaiju eats, you can get an idea of what's in that intestine definitely not pleasant. Kafka fights the urge to vomit and reluctantly accepts the job of dealing with that disgusting part. Arriving home, he complains about how tiring the day was, still feeling that horrible smell. Then, he hears the news about the kaiju attack, where the third division took care of it. They also talk about Captain Mina Ashiro, who not only holds the position of captain at the young age of 27, but has also annihilated many kaijus in her career. This triggers an interesting memory for Kafka from his childhood, when he talked with her about exterminating all the kaijus. The report also mentions that she's a candidate for future division commander, being one of the most popular choices. Seeing her, he wonders why he's on this side, but quickly dismisses the thought, reminding himself that cleaning up is also an important job for the community. He has a good roof over his head and eats what he likes, so that should be enough, right? The next day, Kafka goes to work where one of his colleagues introduces a new guy named Reno Ikikawa. Reno tells them his goal is to join the defense force. Kafka's colleague mentions that Kafka also wanted to join before, but gave up and decided to stay here forever. Reno, very seriously, asks Kafka why he gave up. Kafka responds that he tried his best in his own way, but always felt like there was someone better than him. He basically hit the limit of his own abilities or something like that. He believes he'll understand it better in a few years. But Ikikawa tells him he won't understand it and declares he'll never give up, even if it means dying in the attempt. After that, he leaves while Kafka thinks it's a trap, as no matter what he says, he'll sound miserable. They start working, and Ikikawa ends up dealing with the intestines, which Kafka secretly celebrates. But his smile quickly fades when he's also assigned to that area. Then, a superior mentions that Kafka faces everything head-on, and if he had passed, he would have been a good soldier in the defense force. During their break, Kafka gives some food to Ikakawa, who has no appetite, finding it tough dealing with the intestines. Kafka also tries to give him nose plugs to avoid the horrible smell, despite Ikakawa's reluctance. They spend the rest of the day together after everyone else leaves. Ikakawa takes the opportunity to thank Kafka, admitting that despite their rocky start, he survived the first day thanks to Kafka's help. Before leaving, Ikikawa informs Kafka that the age limit for joining the defense force has been raised to 33 years due to low population. Kafka shrugs it off, saying it's his life and he can do what he wants. However, he notices Ikikawa looked sad when he mentioned giving up. Still, Kafka thinks it's none of his business. If Ikikawa wants to give up, he can. Kafka thanks him, acknowledging he's a great guy and much better than he thought. But just then, a kaiju emerges out of nowhere, trying to devour Ikikawa. Reacting quickly, Kafka pushes him out of harm's way. 
When they are separated, Kafka yells at Ikikawa to run as fast as he can, and when he's in a safe place, he must report the defense force, making it clear that everything will be ruined if he dies here. He manages to convince him to listen to his instructions. After that, Kafka grabs the monster's attention by running straight through the streets with all his might. At one point, he ducks into an alley to block its mobility, then leaps out a window to break it and fall to the ground suddenly. We're shown another flashback from Kafka's past where, as a child, he tells Mina that everything fell apart both his home and hers, and even the school. Instead of feeling sad, he feels great resentment towards the kaijus because he was about to pass the levels of a game when he learns that Miko, his calico cat, died. Suddenly, both of them declare at the same time that they will join the defense force. Kafka tells Mina not to talk nonsense because she's just a baby, while Mina reminds him that he's still in elementary school. This prompts Kafka to suggest competing to see who becomes the coolest soldier and that they both can exterminate kaijus together. Back in the present, Kafka quickly finds himself confronted by the kaiju, cornered by this dreadful creature. He knows he must aim for the legs, but he's easily sent flying by one of its blows. On top of that, another blow fractures his leg, causing him great pain just before being devoured. Suddenly, Ikikawa appears to deliver a solid blow to the kaiju's face with a traffic sign, temporarily incapacitating the monster. He informs Kafka that he has reported the attack, and that if Kafka were to let him down and flee, he would never be a good soldier, which is why he came back. These words strike Kafka, reminding him of parts of his past, feeling even more powerless because nothing has changed. He's unable to take care of his own console, his cat, his friend, or even his co-worker. But before they are eaten, a tiger appears out of nowhere to stop the kaiju, and seconds later, the kaiju is pulverized by high-powered bullets, leaving it in pieces. Thanks to Captain Mina, who assigns the injured to her teammates, the others must accompany her with intentions to sweep the area for residual kaiju. Later, at the hospital, with their wounds attended to, Kafka marvels at Mina's extraordinary feat of ending that terrifying kaiju in just one go. He feels he's now in a place he can't reach, though he gets nervous when Ikikawa suddenly calls him over. Ikikawa tells Kafka that when the kaiju appeared, Kafka told him to run, and if Kafka hadn't saved him at that moment, it would have been his last day alive. Admitting Kafka acted brilliantly surprises him. This reminds Kafka of the childhood competition with Mina about who would become the coolest soldier. Ikikawa reiterates that Kafka really needs to join the defense force, but Kafka, realizing he's been fooling himself, acknowledges his ideas and increases his determination. He thanks Ikikawa, realizing once again that he's a great guy. He doesn't think giving up is really bad, but it's not right to lie to oneself, so he decides to try joining the defense force again. But before he can say anything else, he notices something in front of him. Removing his hand from the view, he's paralyzed by the sight of the flying monster right in front of him. This mysterious being telepathically says it's found him, and before Kafka can scream, it enters his mouth and goes into his body, causing a violent reaction within him. Ikikawa notices something is wrong and tries to see what's happening. Shocked by Kafka's appearance, he realizes something's off. They both scream in shock. Kafka, still in shock, asks if he can recognize him. Then, an old man passing by quickly reports the case, alarming them both. This could get ugly if they're found. This transitions to a scene from Kafka's past with Mina. He explains that when facing a kaiju, you first have to hurt its legs and tie it down. Mina admits she's a bit scared imagining fighting a kaiju much larger than her. Kafka reassures her that he'll always be by her side. In the present, Mina, recalling these thoughts, calls Kafka a liar, as he didn't keep his word. Mina receives a call notifying her of a kaiju sighting at the Yokohama South Hospital and promptly responds to her superior that she'll mobilize her unit to annihilate the creature, and the kaiju was none other than her friend Kafka. Now we see Mina and Kafka as children where she laughs at his cheesy lines from the manga. This makes Kafka embarrassed, asking her not to tell his mom or hers about it because they're both old gossips who immediately tell their friends. After that, Mina thanks him because she won't be afraid if she's with him. But back to the present, Mina gets ready with her squad, informing them that a kaiju was spotted inside the hospital before it could harm anyone, they must take it down no matter what. Alarms go off for this emergency, causing citizens to follow evacuation instructions to the shelters. Returning to the other two, they approach the elderly man who is traumatized after seeing Kafka as a kaiju, and Ikikawa understands they need to clarify this misunderstanding first, so he asks Kafka to smile. He prepares, but his smile ends up being so bad that the old man has a stroke and becomes vegetative. Poor Kafka worries and approaches to see if he's okay, but leaning on the wall generates a tremendous force that destroys a large part of the structure, leaving them both quite scared. Kafka can't believe he really did something like that. Due to the sound and shaking other patients come out of their rooms to see what's happening, and when they do, they see Kafka in that form. 
Ikikawa tells him that the defense division won't take long to arrive, so they decide to flee the place. Besides, if they stay, they'll cause trouble for the hospital. Kafka goes to the window to leave through there, but when he tries to open it, he completely destroys the wall with a single movement. Seeing that, he's fascinated but pretends to be terrified while exclaiming that his body is undergoing a very strange change. After that, they leave the hospital while Mina's division is informed that the kaiju fled from the general hospital in the south of Yokohama and is heading to an area already evacuated as they run through the streets to escape. And Ikikawa wonders since when Kafka is a kaiju without understanding anything about this situation. Because of that, he asks him directly if he's Kafka. When he turns to look at him, he responds that he's not even sure himself, showing himself in a horrible transformation. Kafka tells him he doesn't know what the heck this mode he's turned into is. Suddenly, some claws come out of his mouth, and he throws them at a crow to eat it alive, which disgusts Ikikawa and the rest of us. After that weird thing, he returns to normal, but now Kafka warns Ikikawa about another emergency. He really needs to pee, and Ikikawa asks him to hold it, but Kafka clarifies that it's his body that needs to go, so he can't stop it. Our protagonist starts begging it not to happen because he's a decent person and doesn't want to do that in public. Ikikawa wonders where he'll do it since he doesn't have a similar organ for those things. Then, what happens is Kafka pees through his nipples, yes, the most normal thing in the world. Kafka gets to the point of crawling on the floor, declaring that he won't be able to get married now and prefers to die there. Ikikawa tells him first to worry about his appearance and that they need to keep escaping. Kafka wonders what will become of him now, wanting to know if he can now join the defense division. Ikikawa responds that no, because it's obvious he'll become a target for immediate extermination. After hearing that, Kafka realizes he won't be able to become a soldier anymore. This frustrates him because it happens just when he had sworn to follow Mina's steps, not understanding how he'll do it with this body. At that moment, Ikikawa approaches a sign to discover it's a control perimeter because behind that line everything will be deserted. Before entering there, Kafka gets distracted by hearing something with his enhanced senses. It turns out that something is coming towards them, not soldiers, but something coming from underground, a kaiju emerging at that moment. Mina's squad receives the report of this other kaiju, so she orders vehicle number two to go straight ahead while they follow to the new site. Kafka manages to recognize that this kaiju is of the same species that attacked them. Hearing this, Ikikawa tells him that means more soldiers will come after him, so they need to hide, and it's lucky that people already evacuated thanks to their sighting. In the end, Kafka follows him to escape, both praying for no victims. But it turns out a girl is sad because her mother got trapped by the rubble of their collapsed home. Her mother tells her to flee from this place, but her innocent daughter stays behind to try to save her. Not being able to abandon her, this innocence proves costly because the kaiju notices her presence and approaches to devour her. Her mother keeps pleading for her daughter's life, but then Kafka arrives right next to this kaiju. In his transformed state, he delivers a powerful punch that sends it flying a great distance, smashing through buildings along the way. Kafka is impressed by the incredible power of his punch and then approaches the girl to ask if she's okay, although clearly, she's already scared by his appearance. Kafka tries to smile to reassure her, but once again, it has the opposite effect because she is terrified by his horrible smile. That's when Ikikawa arrives, so Kafka lifts the rubble for him to carry the girl's mother. At that moment, the ugly joker kaiju arrives, so Kafka asks Ikikawa to take care of them with a plan to strike the monster with all his strength. He begins to generate energy that runs through his body, preparing his fist to concentrate the force in his arm. Seeing this, Ikikawa quickly moves away from the area with them to avoid being affected by what's coming. Kafka starts counting to three to finish charging his attack, releasing an enormous force in an uppercut directly at the kaiju. The power of the attack is so great that it lifts the kaiju into the air, which explodes seconds later from the shockwave. The remains of the kaiju are sent flying in all directions, accompanied by a rain of blood. Seeing such brutality, Ikikawa mentions that such power should never be directed at people. Kafka reassures them that there's no danger anymore, and they should take the girl's mother to the hospital. However, due to his appearance and being covered in blood, the girl becomes even more scared. Our protagonist approaches to explain that the defense division will arrive soon, asking her to calm down because he will leave soon. Before leaving, the girl calls him Mr. Kyun Kaiju and thanks him, which touches Kafka, reminding him that as children, Mina also thanked him, proving that he won't be afraid if she's with him. After that, they imagine themselves together in the defense division, understanding that he must go with her. That's why Ikikawa tells him he won't give up after all, as he has to be by Mina's side. While saying that, he controls his transformation to make his head return to normal. Once they leave the place, Mina and her squad arrive at the area, not understanding what happened there. Seeing the remnants of the kaiju they were supposed to eliminate, Mina approaches the girl to reassure her, telling her that they will exterminate all the kaijus. But upon hearing this, the girl approaches her to ask her not to kill Mr. Kanai Kaiju, as he is good and saved her mom. This surprises Mina greatly, as it's the first time she's heard something like this. The next day, the defense division creates a portrait of kaiju number 8 thanks to the witnesses. This is the codename for the eighth specimen, still missing after the incident, obviously referring to Kafka. However, only Ikikawa and Kafka know about this. While listening to the news about it, Ikikawa's boss hands him some letters for Kafka and himself, asking him to deliver his to his companion. These letters contain the results of their enrollment for the defense division. 
Upon reviewing them, Ikikawa confirms that he has passed the first test, and Kafka is happy about it too, as he also passed. After that, Ikikawa rushes to tell Kafka that they both passed, but he lunges at him when he sees him eating in his kaiju mode. Kafka explains that it still happens without him realizing it, but when he tries to return to normal, he still has that terrifying jaw. What happened on that day of the incident is that they returned to the hospital and reported being scared, leading to an evacuation, keeping them safe from any suspicion. At the moment, apparently, no one knows about Kafka's secret. Upon receiving the results of the first test, Kafka doesn't seem very excited because he always fails the second test. Ikakawa asks him if he really intends to take the exam with that body, to which Kafka responds that he shouldn't worry because he's very good at hiding it, although he doesn't seem very convincing while showing that kaiju mouth. Then, Ikakawa reminds him that unlike the written exam, soldiers will be everywhere for the second test. Despite his warnings, Kafka makes it clear that he will still take the exam. Three months have passed since that day, and he has searched everywhere, but hasn't found a way to return to normal. Right now, he's 32 years old. This year's exam is indeed his last chance. Ikikawa accepts that decision, although he clarifies that he will move forward no matter what happens to him. After that, Kafka tries to open a water bottle without success because it's too hard. He goes into his kaiju mode to twist the bottle, crushing Ikikawa's hopes. This prompts Kafka to lunge to hug his leg, desperate, begging him to wait, assuring him that he won't transform that day. Once Ikikawa leaves, Kafka slaps his cheeks to return to normal, determined to get his revenge in the defense division exam. Ten days later, the second selection test for defense division members arrives in West Tokyo. Kafka parks his vehicle in the parking lot, and when they both exit, they are surprised, admiring the base of the defense division. Kafka explains that they share facilities with the self-defense infantry, coordinating in emergencies to send soldiers throughout West Tokyo. Before they go to register, a girl calls Kafka old to get his attention, and it turns out to be this girl. This offends Kafka a lot, so he approaches her to clarify that he's not old, as he's only 32 years old. However, this confirms to her that he is indeed old, and even Chicago agrees with her. That's when she tells him that his car is in her way because she wants to park her vehicle there, claiming that 55 is a lucky number. But because Kafka ignores her, she gets fed up and warns him that she'll move it herself. When she removes her clothes, it's revealed that she has an enhanced suit, using superhuman strength to lift Kafka's car and throw it to another empty spot. After doing that, she tells them both that she is applicant number 2016, introducing herself as Kikuru Shinomiya, and her hobby is killing Kaijus. Ikakawa recognizes that surname, and suddenly she approaches Kafka to mention that he smells like kaiju and not human. Ikakawa quickly says they're part of a team that deals with giant monsters. Kikuru is surprised when Kafka effortlessly lifts his truck. She thinks he must have his own special abilities. Kafka introduces himself as examinee number 2032, and dramatically tells Kikuru to remember his name. His cool introduction gets interrupted when he sees that Kikuru's butler took his parking spot. Kikaru thought the exam would be boring, but now finds it interesting. She's determined to outdo Kafka and leaves. Ikikawa is angry with Kafka for using his powers already. Kafka explains he only transformed a part she couldn't see. They tell some guards that the noise was nothing, but Ikikawa warns Kafka he'll be sent home if he keeps causing trouble. Kafka knows this is his last chance to support Nina, so he promises not to give up. However, during the exam, he struggles a lot. He's been training hard every day, but he can't keep up. Ikikawa explains the exam has two parts, a fitness test and an aptitude test. They can't change their aptitude, so they need to do their best in the fitness test. However, Kafka is doing very poorly. He was always below average, but now it's even worse. He wonders if people get weaker after turning 30. Thinking about transforming, he realizes it would be crazy. Unfortunately, Kafka does very badly and gets a low rank of 219 out of 225. Kikaru proudly reveals she ranked 5th and teases Kafka for being easily outshone. Kafka regrets his earlier dramatic introduction and wishes Kikaru would forget his name now. Ikikawa is relieved Kafka didn't use his powers, but Kafka admits he only said that to sound cool and now wishes he had used them. He believes he would have done better, but Ikikawa thinks there's another reason for his low rank. Elsewhere, Mina reviews this year's applicants. Her subordinate assumes she won't care, but she surprises him by showing interest, especially in a guy named Hoshina, who graduated top of his class. Ikikawa also notices Izumo, who ranked second. The third ranked applicant is Ayaru, a valedictorian from a prestigious university, while the top spot goes to Kagari, a rising star in the Japan Ground Self-Defense Force. Most applicants this year are from elite universities, aiming for officer roles rather than field work, which may explain Kafka's low rank. 
They realize the top applicants are exceptionally strong, but all eyes are on Kikiro, who graduated from a California program at 16 and is hailed as the greatest talent ever. Kafka is amazed by Kikiro's achievements, but gets beaten up by her bodyguards for touching her, making everyone think he's just a fan. Kikiro laughs at him, but Kafka vows to surpass her. Despite Kafka's determination, things aren't going well. However, Ikikawa remains hopeful. In the past two years, the second part of the exam involved Kaiju Corp's disposal, testing applicants' knowledge and teamwork skills. This part of the test is why Ikikawa chose to work part-time in the disposal unit, giving Kafka hope for the next stage of the exam. They decide to give their all in the upcoming test. They arrive at the second training area where Vice Captain Hoshina introduces himself. He explains that they'll be tested on their ability to deal with Kaiju. Kafka gets excited, thinking they'll just have to dispose of kaiju bodies as Ikikawa said. But he's shocked when Hoshino reveals they have to find and neutralize the kaiju instead. Kafka is startled when a powerful kaiju attacks Hoshina, but security measures stop it. Although Kafka is surprised, the top applicants seem eager for this part of the exam. Karu laughs at Kafka's reaction, making him wonder what happened to just disposing of the bodies. Ikikawa explains that disposing of bodies was the past two years' task, and he's disappointed too. Hoshina warns that this part of the exam is dangerous, so they'll wear Zumo Tech gear. Ikikawa tries it on, and is amazed at how it enhances his strength. The suits are made from kaiju organic material, boosting the wearer's combat power significantly. Konami, another operator, measures the combat power of those wearing the suits. Ikikawa's is 8%, Izumo's is 18%. Kagari's is 15%, and Iheru's is 14%. Unleashed combat power shows how much of the suit's power the wearer can draw out, usually around 20%. Hoshina wonders if this year will surpass expectations since all three are over 10%. Everyone is shocked when Kikru's unleashed combat power is 46%, already at the level of a platoon leader. It's assumed to be a record since she hasn't joined the force yet. Ikikawa feels down about his 8%, but Hoshina reassures him it's good for a first try. As long as examinees don't score zero, they pass. Hoshina admits he's never seen a zero before, but everyone is shocked when Kafka's unleashed combat power is 0%. They laugh at him, and even Konami wonders if there was an error. Kafka asks for more time to improve his combat power. Hoshina bursts into uncontrollable laughter, explaining that increasing combat power isn't as simple as going to the bathroom, it can't just be squeezed out. Despite liking Kafka, Hoshina doubts he'll pass the exam. Kafka tries hard to figure out how to improve his combat power before the exam ends, frustrating Kikaru, who wishes she'd demonstrate the power she used in the parking lot. Hoshina enters the room and announces it's time for the final part of the exam. Their targets are one Hanu and 36 Kaiju scattered throughout an urban area. These Kaiju caused 16 casualties and were captured alive for training purposes. Examinees will use anti-Kaiju weapons to fight them, monitored by drones. If an examinee is in danger, the suit's shield will activate to save them, but they'll fail the exam. Hoshina warns of the extreme danger and leaves it up to the examinees to decide if they want to participate. The test begins, and Kikuru quickly takes down two kaiju, impressing everyone. Kafka urges them to push forward, but Ikikawa points out Kafka's holding them back. Kafka blames the heavy weapons, trying to sound cool by calling himself the Zero, but Ikikawa isn't impressed. The situation worsens when Ikikawa notes their lack of offensive power compared to others. Hoshina reveals Mina has arrived to watch the exam, reminding Kafka of their competition to become the cooler defense force officer. Kafka stops caring about being a zero and realizes they need to adapt. He questions why drones are watching if they just need to count kaiju eliminated. They realize they should support the attackers since they lack offensive capability. Finding a nearby fight, they position themselves to help. Kafka spots the kaiju's hooves and remembers facing it during a cleanup. His experience tells him stun grenades work well against it due to its weak eyesight and sharp hearing. Guiding the attackers, he directs Isumo to aim for its stomach, the weak spot, and they're surprised when they defeat the beast. They thank Kafka for his support, but he's upset about being called Karo's groupie in the observation room. However, they notice Kafka and Ikikawa's actions. Kafka points out they've dismantled many kaiju bodies, giving him confidence. He's relieved he doesn't need his kaiju power and feels excited to make up for his mistakes. 
but his optimism ends abruptly when a kaiju appears, slamming Kafka into a building and severely injuring him. Konami detects his condition, but as the kaiju approaches, they prepare to activate his suit's shield. Kafka realizes this means he'll fail the exam, especially with Mina watching. Determined not to embarrass himself, he tries to stand, but the kaiju is about to attack. Konami starts the shield activation, and Hashina expects Kafka to drop out first, finding it a shame since he's funny. However, the kaiju gets destroyed, and Kakuro appears for the third time, declaring nobody quits while she's on the battlefield. Kafka is impressed by Kakuro's strength, but she cuts him off, declaring she'll keep defeating kaiju while he stays down like a loser. The others notice she's aiming for the main target, but they refuse to let her take it alone. Kakuro effortlessly takes out another kaiju, leaving Aihiru amazed and questioning if she's wearing the same suit as them. Kafka wants to join in, but his broken leg prevents him from standing. Hoshina explains Kafka has multiple fractures and possibly organ damage. Kafka wonders if this means he has to give up, but he refuses to entertain the thought. He recalls feeling powerless with 0% combat power, fearing he could never stand by Mina's side. Frustrated by the notion that only the talented succeed, Hoshina suggests Kafka drop out, warning the suit shields aren't perfect. Defiant, Kafka decides he'll determine if he gives up or not. He declares he'll chase his dreams again, despite feeling too old and looking foolish. As he makes this declaration, everyone in the observation room is shocked to see his combat power increase to 1%. Kafka vows not to give up this time, catching Mina's attention. Kafka manages to stand up even though his leg is broken, pretending to feel fine when he can't stop trembling. Sashiro warns him that if things get bad, they'll activate the shield right away, which makes Kafka very happy because he won't be disqualified anymore and can continue. At that moment, he starts coughing, showing he's really not well. Ikikawa tells him not to worry about him and to move forward as much as he can, reminding him of his promise to give his all no matter what happens. Still, Ikikawa reaches out his hand and asks him to let him help. Hoping they both do what they can, this surprises Kafka, remembering the times he saved him, taking his word to finish by taking his hand. Sashiro can't stop laughing as he watches them both on the screen, seeing that Kafka climbed onto Ikikawa's shoulders, which was the best option to move forward because of his broken leg, calling it the fusion operation. Ikikawa feels very embarrassed that others see him, while Kafka asks him to make the best of his suit while he gives him a hand. Sashiro keeps laughing at this situation, mentioning they should already be approved, but in the clown exam. Suddenly, Ikikawa starts running faster, catching Kafka off guard, heading straight to Kikaru to support her. Meanwhile, the other participants keep fighting the leftover monsters. We see Kikaru taking the lead, smashing the monsters in her way due to her great firepower and mobility. Kikaru knocks down the residual monsters so quickly that others don't even get a chance to support her. At one point, she uses an iron bar to fight hand to hand with several of them, utilizing her incredible strength. It's announced that she has knocked down the last secondary monster in the Delta area and will now enter combat with the main one. When facing it, Kikaru throws a grenade directly at its head, then maneuvers around nearby buildings to propel herself toward the monster's mouth, landing right in it. She holds on between its teeth with her legs in a perfect split, firing a highly powered bullet inside its mouth, destroying the monster from within with a huge explosion. Once she gets off it, the shattered body of the main kaiju collapses to the ground, signaling the end of the last test. Kafka didn't expect this, and he complains about how fast Kikaru was, as they couldn't even catch up with her. He feels the pain of his wounds again, falling to the ground exhausted, and the same happens with Ikikawa. The drones return to base, ceasing to monitor the participants, and they start assisting the injured, following the procedure that needs to be followed. Sashiro thinks this ended too soon, considering the effort it took to prepare for this main kaiju, and Mina mentions that Kikaru was better than the rumors say. Hearing this, Sashiro mentions he had anticipated around 30 retreats, but none did, resulting in the minimum number of injuries, thanks to Kikaru's presence, being the director's daughter. Referring to the saying, like father, like daughter, he believes she'll undoubtedly be the pillar of the defense division. Returning to her, Kikaru asks her father if her performance was perfect, then decides to leave, wanting to see Kafka's face of suffering before going. However, as she turns around, she notices too late a new presence appearing behind her. When she looks back, she's suddenly pierced by a projectile through her chest. Both Kafka and Ikikawa feel exhausted from their efforts in vain, but they're grateful she could continue in the exam because of her. They hope to see the results, but suddenly, the residual kaiju corpses start rising from the ground, prompting Ikikawa to suggest evacuation. 
Returning to Kikaru, she begins to suffer from the serious damage of that wound, managing to protect her heart by focusing her shield on one point, allowing her to still fight. She fixes her gaze on that humanoid kaiju without knowing what the heck that thing is. It starts talking to the big kaiju beside it, which surprises Kikaru because it's a kaiju that can speak. As she recovers from the hemorrhage, she tries to react by aiming her weapon at it, but she's continuously bombarded by a bunch of shots from this unknown kaiju. The control room receives information about anomalies in Kikaru's vital signs, and they can hear the screams of pain she emits. They don't know what's happening because the drone isn't watching her, but they do learn that the signals of the down kaiju are returning. Sashiro doesn't understand how this can happen since these kaiju shouldn't have such an attribute. That's when they're informed that the estimated wave level of the main kaiju is 6-4. Seeing that its level has risen, Mina orders activating the student's shields and bringing back the drones to show the situation. She also asks Sushiro to accompany her, and they head directly to the test field to deal with the situation. All participants begin to evacuate, but Kikaru stays on the ground while treating her wounds with her suit. She understands that if everyone evacuates, someone has to stay to stop the thing in front of her. Otherwise, it will take several victims. She managed to stop the bleeding with the kaiju's muscle tissue, repeating to herself that she can still fight, not allowing any victims in her battlefield. That's when she remembers the words her father constantly repeated to her about being perfect for the future of their country. However, the main kaiju delivers a powerful blow that sends her flying into a nearby building, leaving her stunned by the impact. This leads us to flashbacks of her past, where one of her schoolmates admired her for being extraordinary as she was the best in school. This girl leaves when her father calls her, receiving praise from him for her good grades. Meanwhile, Kikaru is left alone as her father doesn't pick her up, but Sebastian, her butler, approaches to inform her that her father will arrive home today. When she sees him, she tells him about her admission with honors, but her father says it's the least he expects and warns her not to rest on her laurels, as someone else will surpass her. He tells her she must remain perfect for the good of the country's future and for her mother in heaven, which is a low blow. But well, with those memories in her mind, Kikaru still keeps that mindset to stand up in this fight against the main kaiju. However, she's hit once again by this powerful monster, which doesn't make her give up. But there comes a moment when she drops her weapon, realizing she can't fight anymore with her broken arm. The kaiju starts evolving its horns on its head, and by that point, the drones arrive in the area. The main kaiju realizes it's regenerating its lost horns and is also compressing energy. This worries Sushiro, not knowing if they'll arrive in time. This monster keeps charging a powerful attack towards Kikaru, who at this point only apologizes to her father for not being perfect. Suddenly, Kafka appears before her to congratulate her for her good performance, and right after that, the main kaiju fires its attack at them. Kikuru doesn't get hurt as Kafka protects her, for which she thanks her for her effort while transforming into his kaiju form. Once ready, he stands in front to handle the situation. Meanwhile, the other students use torches to signal the injured and continue with the evacuation. As for Ikikawa, he's worried about Kafka because moments before they were together, but when they announced Kikaru in combat, Kafka disappeared from his sight, and Ikikawa knew he was going to transform to protect Kikaru, so he heads there to provide support. Kikaru also sees that Kafka has just transformed, which shocks her. Kafka kneels before her and asks her not to tell anything to the defense division, completely ignoring the giant monster behind them. It fires another attack at him, but Kafka deflects it with a simple blow, as if it were nothing. Lastly, Kafka tells her he'll give him the details later, planning to blow away that kaiju in a second as he starts charging his energy, preparing one of those powerful strikes. Meanwhile, in the control room, Konomi reports that unknown energy has been detected near the main kaiju, and there's a possibility of a new kaiju. They don't have an image due to interference from the shockwave. The kaiju starts evolving, and the drones arrive just in time. The main kaiju begins to regenerate, worrying Sashiro, but Kafka, fully charged, prepares to deliver a powerful blow with support from his suit's boosters. He clashes fists with the main kaiju, unleashing a shockwave so powerful it causes a massive explosion. After the dust settles, they see that the main kaiju was almost completely pulverized, leaving only its legs and some organs. Kafka jokes about it trying to revive, but he quickly regrets it when he sees the remains stirring. He runs to Kikaru to eliminate a residual kaiju behind her with a simple blow. Now that everything's over, he approaches Kikaru to revert his transformation, expressing relief that she's safe. But Ikakawa scolds Kafka for transforming, worried they might get caught. Kikaru suddenly faints, and later, Sashiro and Mina arrive at the combat zone, finding only the remnants of the main kaiju. Konomi informs them that the missing applicants, including Kafka, Kikaru, and Ikakawa, have been secured. Sushiro doesn't believe Kikaru could have done this alone, and there are many mysteries surrounding the incident. He also recalls a similar case months ago. 
In the hospital, Kafka tells Ikikawa that it's been a while since he competed with such great people, reminding him of something important about following dreams. Mina overhears and later thanks them for saving Kikaru, carrying her to safety. She then leaves without saying more, avoiding any questions while tending to her wounds. Sashiro approaches Kikaru, telling her they took care of the revived kaiju thanks to her defeating the main one. Surprised, he asks if she was the one who defeated it. Kikaru remembers Kafka's words after saving her, and after a few seconds of silence, admits she defeated it. In another scene, the humanoid kaiju is in a public bathroom listening to the news of the incident. Surprised by the strength of the applicants, it learns that there were no casualties and that kaiju number 8 is still missing. Confused, it receives a call asking about its whereabouts. It transforms into a human form, posing as a kaiju cleaner, and leaves the bathroom, giving the excuse of stomachache. No one suspects its true identity, and it leaves without a trace, bringing the episode to an end.